as you can tell, uh, that we're much smaller than a lot of the applications that uh, are being talked about here today. When I was in the sessions this morning, everybody was talking about 100 million users. I was like, okay, this is going to be a little bit different than what we're doing. But um, you can tell by the crowd that it is. Um, so we, um, just a little bit of context on, on what, what we're doing at the Globe, which has a, a bit to do with Erlang, but um, also is, uh, has been a new approach to, to developing a news platform. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about that and why, why, we, why we did what we did and then uh, how we used Erlang to uh, help us accomplish it. So, um, you know, the Globe has been around since 1872. So it's been, we like to think about it, it's been innovating since since then. So uh, all the way back to 1872, 1873, when it really was the template for uh, what became the modern newspaper. So um, Charles Taylor uh, uh, started that uh, trend back in 1873 by adding certain types of content to the paper, really turning the, turning the Globe around. In 1995, actually not 1997, we started uh, Boston.com, which has become uh, the largest regional website in the country and um, and uh, so we see about seven million unique users to boston.com and it's always been one of the the, the, the biggest newspaper websites uh, out there and then this past year we launched bostonglobe.com and in, in some of the tweets we got we, we got a fair amount of uh, praise for some of the work we did uh, using responsive design and some other techniques to, to build bostonglobe.com and and I think actually some of the use of Erlang and and the my saved feature the offline reading capabilities actually were were uh, a part of that innovation that really got Got recognized uh, for our launch. So just a little bit, little bit of background. We, we had Boston.com since 1995, and then we um, decided in, at the end of 2010 and into 2011 to launch BostonGlobe.com. So we, the reason we did that was to capture two different types of audiences. So the Boston Globe, we wanted to be more authoritative, more about journalism, more long form uh, journalistic content and boston.com is uh, a site where we're continuing to build out um, is more around community more about sort of real time more personal more fun more practical so we now have these two sites that are very different uh, to each other trying to trying to reach our markets in 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 two different ways so the difference between the two is that the globe is a subscription oriented site so you have to be a subscriber to the newspaper or pay for digital access so we're we're sort of at the beginning of this trend of paying for news content and uh, bostonglobe.com is, is is our real um, step in that direction so what we what we decided ultimately to do was 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 break off the globe's content make it exclusive to bostonglobe.com and charge charge users for that so we, we, we charge about fifteen dollars a month unless you also get the print product which which you get the uh, digital uh, content for free so we at the same time have added a lot of new features we've Try to design a site that's uh, that's very clean, very uncluttered, relatively ad-free, and that's part of the value you get as a BostonGlobe.com user and part of what you what you're paying for. So the experience and the functionality is as much of the the value to the reader as uh, as the content. And then Boston.com will continue to develop as an ad-supported free site. It, it, it will always be our largest scale website, uh, at, and you know with its seven million users will. Um, you know, we'll, we'll always be about sports and fun and community and, and interactions between our journalists and our users, um, but we'll continue to, to expand out al along those lines. Um, the, the challenge that, 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 we, that we had was we had a short window of time to launch BostonGlobe.com, and what we really um, came to was that, you know, we believe that as a news organization and as a newspaper, our future is in mobile, so our future is on devices, it's, it's on tablets. So we wanted to build a, a platform and build a news site that was ready for that future, where, where more people would ultimately be accessing us on mobile devices than they would on uh, desktops. So the, the approach we took from the beginning was, was, was believing that that's where, the, where, where our future was. We, um, we decided instead of, of building a, a whole bunch of different apps for different uh, uh, platforms, we instead um, built the site using a technique called responsive design, which was at, at the time had been tested in a few, few areas but had never really been fully implemented on a, on a large scale. So the idea of, of responsive design is the user comes in, um, the, the, the system detects their screen, uh, screen width, so it serves an appropriate design. As you see, we, we, we designed six different versions of the site. So, that, so the site itself then sort of adapts to your screen size and also to your capabilities. So if you have touch capabilities or offline storage capabilities, the, the site will, will detect that and de you know, deliver you through the browser you know, some app-like um, functionality and features. So the idea was one, one code base in the browser that, that uh, you know, where, where users had the capabilities um, that we would, would give them app-like functionality. And that was 
partly a business decision, um, you know, because as a subscription site, if you're in the Apple store, you have to pay, give them 30 percent. So that wasn't, that wasn't too appealing to us. And also, you know, we really believed in, in HTML5 and where that's going. And as a news site, we, we you know, believe that in a few years, um, apps will, will probably be uh, unnecessary or maybe unnecessary for sites like ours to just do, you know, the, the basics of news delivery and, and content uh, and, and information. Um, one of the big innovations, and Kaz uh, sitting over here in the hat is our uh, lead engineer on the project, um, was we really wanted to uh, begin to allow uh, users to, to experience our content and the site offline. So the, the My Saved feature was something that we came up through some research and focus groups with users who we saw would, um, would often go to the Globe site and open up a whole bunch of stories in different browser windows and then go through and each, read each browser window and close them out. So we sort of looked at that and turned that into a feature in the beginning, which, which became my save. We, we tried to think of as simple uh, and direct a, a name for that as possible, which allows you to, to on, on each story, hover over and save a story to a play, almost like a playlist for your stories. So you can save it to this uh, little area um, and go back and read, read through it all at once. At, at the same time, that functionality is then available offline. So if, you, if you're um, online and you have uh, offline capabilities through your device and through your browser, then, that, then you, and you, and you lose your connection, you're able to go read those stories offline. So they were you know, taking that element of, of an app and, uh, and building it, in, it into the website. And that was where we used, that was where we used Erlang to, to help us. And, I, and I'll, um, I'll show you just a quick overview of the Globe site and, uh, and then I'll talk about how it's gone and, and the use of Erlang. Introducing the new Boston Globe With responsive design, contact besides its joining device. Touch feature navigation allows you to swipe, pinch, and scroll to the heart of the soul. Turn to my save for a playlist of stories that you want to play later. With the new article, enjoy a continuous reading experience that's all ours. All right, great music, huh? Um, so, uh, so, th so that gives you a little bit of an overview of the site and how we marketed it and really came out with a browser-based uh, site that worked across, or across all platforms. So um, the My Save feature was, was, was unique, um, was our first step, as I said, into really letting users experience the site offline. And, and Kaz really, uh, really drove that effort um, in trying to find a solution that, that would allow us to do that. Um, you know, we have scale. Uh, in, at least in our, in our world. Um, so we, we had about six million users on Boston.com and we added another 1.3 million users um, to when we added BostonGlobe.com. So it's by no means the, the level of scale that I've heard uh, talked about today. But um, in, in our world, it's still, uh, it's, it, it still was pretty big. So, so we needed a solution that would allow you know, the page to load and um, for it, you know, every, every time the page loads, it checks for every story to see if the user has saved that story, so that that state is either it says saved or and you can save and unsave. So, so there's a communication back and forth from each individual item on the page to the My Saved system, so that you can see which stories on the page you've already saved and not. Um, and, and so that, that was one of the primary reasons that, uh, that we used uh, Erlang to, to build that was um, to you know, to, to handle that scale. So, you know, how, how did Kaz um, convince a 140-year-old newspaper to use Erlang to build a website um, is kind of, you know, the, the theme of this, I think. And uh, some of the reasons were, uh, you know, we, we had a content management system that's, that had, does a lot of caching on the, on the front end. So this, we didn't really have, it didn't have elements of real time and, uh, and, and we needed that in order to do what we wanted with, with my saved or else, uh, you know, it would have been a mess. So um, we wanted to create um, we wanted to create a, a system that um, 
that would tie into our registration uh, system, and Erlang allowed us to plug into that uh, uh, without having to, to rebuild it, so it could tie into some of our legacy systems that were already compliant with PCI and other security uh, um, standards. And then we have plans down the road and you know, where we see our sites and both sites actually evolving is towards a much more real-time uh, environment for you know, news and updating asynchronously into the page, uh, comments, uh, you know, you letting users comment and real-time see updates of, of, of people talking about the story. So we just see the pace of, of updating and the pace of uh, content flowing from, pay, from our pages um, and into our pages accelerating. So, so we wanted to have a system like this in place uh, that, that would allow us to build new features that, and, and, and then be able to handle it. So um, Kaz pulled this, um, this chart for me, which uh, I can understand to a certain extent, um, but I'm probably the least technical person on these two floors. So um, uh, this shows you the, 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 um, the Erlang servers, and it's actually sending more information to the servers per second than uh, and then it's getting back. So you can see how um, you know, it's, it's sending about 800K per second to the MySafe server and it's getting about 300K back, which is just a, a yes or no, this user has this story saved. Um, and that's coming, you know, coming back really quickly and, uh, and, and you know, it's not, it, has, it has handled the load of, of our million users uh, you know, e exceptionally well. So that's, that's, a, that's another thing that, that we really liked about it. Some of the, the reasons we used it was um, that uh, it was something that allowed us to plug in other tools and other technologies that, that we already had. Um, and as, as, as Kaz uh, sort of pitched us, it's, you know, it has had a long history of development, unlike some of the other uh, languages and, and techniques we use. We, we considered like, like Node.js. Um, and it was a really fast development uh, uh, environment for us to, to build in. And you know, we had, um, I don't know, maybe a month or so two to build this feature out. So it was a very, very fast. Uh, process to, to, to build this out, and I think that um, you know, without without something like Erlang, we would never have gotten it done. Um, there was uh, some of the some of the error hand, error um, messaging was uh, was convenient um, uh, to our to our developers, and there has been a growing community of of Erlang usage in Boston, um, thanks to to Basho and others. Um, so there there had there there were people who who knew about this in in the Boston area, being in you know, we're, we're around MIT and, and uh, all the uh, universities, that, that, that would make sense, and where Bell Labs used to be, um, that would make sense. Um, so it's kind of a growing community, but uh, you know, still, still relatively small, but, but there, there was expertise. And, and in our case, that was really one person who, who said, you know, th th this, is, you know th this is how we should build it, and um, that has sort of you know, pro proliferated throughout our development team, and now we have more and more people who have, uh, who have, who have learned and gotten to, gotten to use the language and, and the platform. Um, some of the challenges, and, and, and really Kaz helped me put this together, but uh, there, may not, there aren't as many libraries available for things like text, text processing, geospatial data, um, which would be important to a content site like ours. So uh, Erlang wasn't necessarily, I guess, developed with these things in mind, and there are less, less, less modules already out there to, to, to pick and choose from and, and to just plug in. And you know it is harder to find people who know this system. And you know, being uh, you know, uh, we are a news company first, and we're sort of a software development company and a web development company second now. Um, so we do have to think about what systems we put in and our ability to support those, um, you know, in the future. So you know, one of the considerations was you know, w will we be able to always have uh, staff who understands the system and and is able to work with it? So um, we haven't. And, and to that point, I think um, you know, we've had developers really quickly. Come up to speed and, and learn uh, and, and and learn Erlang and have uh, you know built things out in it. So so far, it's uh, it hasn't really been a hurdle uh, for us, and and we all felt comfortable that um, it will be something we could could, con could continue to support. So moving moving forward, um, you know, I think like I said earlier, it's 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 really about uh, it's really allowed us to think about how our site is going to evolve into much more of a real-time system and how we, you know, how we update content on the page uh, much more aggressively than we do now. Um, we think that'll allow, also help us with uh, the next generation of our news apps so, and offline reading, so uh, being able to, uh, to, to, to better uh, show people what they've read, what they haven't read, save things, um, and, and do a lot more through the browser with, um, with, uh, with their local storage. 
And um, you know, we haven't had to, to implement uh, a lot of hardware in order to support these systems, so that's obviously a huge, huge advantage. And um, we've had, you know, we've just needed a few people to really implement uh, uh, this system, and, and uh, so people can get up quickly. And you know, I think ultimately, from you know, someone like me who's who's a business guy and, and really is you know in charge of just making sure that we build the right things on time and that they make money and um, do all the right things. You know, I mean, happy developers are equal a happy VP. So that's you know that's good. That's a good reason to use Erlang. So um, if Gaz is happy, we're happy. So. Um, it, oh, but also serious, seriously, we um, you know it, it, it is I think something that people have enjoyed being able to experiment with uh, with Erlang in a in a new environment like like news and uh, and it, and it's I think one of the one of the one of the things we got a little bit of credit for when we launched BostonGlobe.com the responsive design sort of overshadowed everything because it had never been done to that to that level but this is a this is a gem uh, sitting in within our platform now that will allow the globe and and uh, our future and Boston.com to to really shine uh, moving forward as you know the the websites and and web apps and apps just uh, you know really kind of become one, one and the same in our world. So um, so we're we're really excited about um, where this could take us. And um, that's it. That's all I really have. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd love to uh, love to take them. So, so we're running, um, uh, it's, a, it's called Method. It's from a company called Eidos, uh, an Italian company that um, is very publisher specific. So it's, uh, the Wall Street Journal uses it, the Washington Post uses it, and it, it has a web portal which serves out all the pages. Um, and it's the same system that our reporters are using to enter and, and write stories at the beginning of the process. So it's this end-to-end -end publishing solution. So um, things like real-time uh, real publishing aren't really built into it right now. But it's the only CMS that prints a newspaper and publishes a website. Right. Yeah, so you have one system that both prints the paper, you can lay it out, and you can lay out, you know, it, it, it's, it's sort of a platform agnostic CMS, so the people, the con content contributor, con the reporters, the editors are writing, and, you know, it, a story could start out as a tweet, it could evolve into a blog post, it could then be sent to Boston.com. It could be sent to BostonGlobe.com. At some point, it may go to print. So it's, it, it's sort of at the beginning of the, the system, the, the content is platform agnostic. And uh, it could end up you know, in any number of places across all of our properties. And that, that's a huge step for, for newspapers that have had systems in-house you know, from the 80s. And it used to always be that um, the web was the last thing to get the content from, from the newsroom. Now it's the first thing. So um, we've really, we've really changed, uh, flipped that around. So. Yes. How does the I'm sorry the content? Yeah, how does the content management system that you're talking about integrate with print? So it's it's really um, the, right now the the print uh, uh, component of the system is being implemented. So we started with uh, 300 reporters and editors using the system to write and edit content, and then pushed it to BostonGlobe.com. And then uh, the step we're in right now is we're implementing the print component, so, that, so the paper's laid out using the same system, so it flows right into the printed product. So um, if there's a change in print, it flows back to the original source, so, there, so, so there's, one, there's one giant database of content. And print is just one component of that. Is that custom really simpler for doing the print stuff, or you've got InDesign plugins, or how's that work? Um, I'm not, do, do you know, Kaz? I, I stay away from that part of it. I think it. I think it does use InDesign, I believe, um, and so so it is, it is integrating into a, a layout system that already is pre-existing. I don't think they've totally created their own. Um, so I know that there was we had we had used the other system for print layout, and so there was a there was a switch involved in in moving to, to this system. But a few huge benefits, obviously, to having it all all in one place. Yes. It's a great question. Um, not not currently. Uh, actually, one of the things we didn't have a lot of time to do was build a lot of uh, uh, dashboards for, for reporting. So we know that there are about 80,000 stories saved right now, but we're not actually um, using that in any real-time way. But we have talked about using it as a um, 
as a most popular gauge, so, so most saved or something like that. Um, we're actually moving all of our, our most popular, most viewed into probably a combination of, um, of, of, of uh, signals. So those would be most shared, you know, so Facebook, Twitter, and probably we'll create a, an algorithm that combines all those things to, to say sort of a most, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, most shared, most saved, most popular, and kind of condense it all into one. So my saved could be a, one signal into that, or it could be its own, uh, own, own little widget on the site that shows what people are saving. We are, so we use a, a, a third party for commenting right now, which uh, it was, has been problematic. So um, we're plugging that into the site you know, using uh, an API, I believe. Um, so, so you can comment on stories on boston.com, same thing. So we're actually revamping that entire system this year to be more of a, um, more of a platform for user-generated content, not just a commenting system. And, and actually, Kaz has been working on uh, a prototype in Erlang to, to power that entire commenting system so that uh, you know, it can be more real time and, and can be a really quick uh, and fast reacting system. So we see both, you know, those elements of both sites just, just continuing to grow. I worked with the BBC for three years and that was one of our big uh, questions. You know, I think moving towards user generated content and uh, you know, the, the man on the street being a reporter and feeling like that. It, in, in, yeah, in our world, that. that Oh, absolutely. I mean, we th that we see a lot of opportunity here here with that. And in our world, that was part of the reason we separated the two sites, so Boston.com and BostonGlobe.com. Um, you know, Boston Globe is going to be more editor-driven and journalist down, whereas Boston.com will much be much more user up. So um, a lot of those technologies we'll, we'll use on Boston.com as well. Are you pretty interested in doing much of actually the decision process amnesia? So uh, amnesia. I'll let Kaz answer that. So um, the main reason was that um, if you're building something in Erlang, you're using Amnesia, then it's all in memory right there. And you have a bunch of web heads that are the web servers that are taking in requests, and they each have um, in memory copies of all the data. And then you have one or two backups that have disk copies as well. So you have very, very fast read time. Snap, snap, snap. You don't have to check it. Because we're just storing the, the reference to the story, yeah. right? So we're not saving the actual story and everyone's you know, in the database. We're just saving you know, the fact that this user has saved this, this URL. So it's a, it's a pretty light amount of information being stored on, you know, right now on each individual user. That may change as we look at user-generated content and, and, other, uh, and other, other systems. But for, for at least for my save, it's relatively light. Yeah, it was it was another reason to it, it, speed. You know, was a, was a factor for sure, and our TBAs were busy doing other things. Um, but do you think we'll use that database for the commenting platform? Um, I think we might end up using it right now as kind of the first layer um, because we already have all the users in there, and even though it's a very fast proxy for our registration system, so even if we're stuffing the user generated content in a more traditional database or something that can take more stuff into it. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.